the objective of today's lecture is simple. We want to steer a needle to a certain point in the tissue. How can you do that? Or how can a robot do that instead? The problem is rather simple. It's a very simple statement. You have a long needle like this one. They want to put that into a tissue and you want the tip to reach a certain target. Right? Doesn't sound very complicated, does it? But it, it might be more technically challenging than you think. First, you can see the needle is, is uh, flexible, so it may bend away from where you want it to be. And you can uh, imagine that uh, if you don't reach the target you want, especially when you're delivering a drug, uh, that can cause a lot of um, complications. So this is a very common medical procedure, and the objective of this lecture is to develop a, a see how we could develop a system to help steer these needles towards a certain point in the tissue. So the contents that you see here, this is more like a graduate level. It's all from research, right? so I'm not going to be asking you specific questions about it. Uh, there's a lot of math involved, and I don't expect you to understand it all. And just to see, um, just to have an idea, as an example of being confronted with a technical problem, and then uh, solving that technical problem using uh, techniques that we can find in other fields. We'll see one example today. To model a needle in a tissue, we are going to use vibrational mechanics and mo modes of vibration of a cantilever beam. Right? You wouldn't expect to see that in a medical robotics application, but um, we can borrow these techniques from other fields and then apply to the problem we want. So rather than focusing on the specific methods that I'm going to show, what I wanted to focus on is on the big picture, on how we go about solving a problem, defining a problem, and then solving it using uh, different methods. To do that, I'm, I chose the, the problem of uh, targeting a tissue for, or during needle-based interventions. So the objective of this lecture is to understand the concept of tool steering in soft tissue, model tool tissue interaction, and then develop a tool steering controller using um, some sort of robotic assistance. The problem, uh, as I said, is very simple. We have a surgical needle and we want to insert this needle all the way into the tissue, which will probably hurt a little bit given how big it is. And but we want it to reach a certain point in the tissue. So how can we actually uh, do that? And can a robot be used to help uh, achieve, a better achieve a better accuracy uh, as compared to manual needle insertion? I'll pass these ones around later. I uh, just wanted to talk about something first before I do that. So here's one example of needle-based applications. This is for prostate cancer treatment. So when you have for patients with prostate cancer, some level of prostate cancer, uh, they are, uh, small radioactive pellets are inserted into the prostate and then they are left in the prostate to kill the cancer cells. So they, they will emit radiation and then the radiation will slowly kill the cancer cells over the course of several weeks. So to do that, to place these seeds, recall them, inside the prostate, we we'll use long needles like that that are loaded with these seeds to insert the needle in and then you use a stylet to push them out and then you leave them permanently in the prostate and then uh, the radiation will kill the cancer cells. I'm talking about prostate cancer here but this is also used in other applications such as liver and breast uh, cancer and many others in fact. <clears throat> Here's another example, instead of depositing seeds we inserted these needles in the tissue and then we connected them to a high source of radiation. This is called high dose rate brachytherapy. And once they are inserted, we turn on the machines, and these machines will pass radiation through the tubes and down to the tissue. So if we identify a prostate, uh, a prostate, identify a lesion in the tissue, we'll place the needles around, create a radiation plan, and then each needle will deliver a specific dose of radiation to cover the area under treatment. The patient is here. Right? This is the perineum of the patient, and you have all these needles being inserted at once to cover a specific area. So now you can imagine that if you put the needle in and the needle goes away from where you want, you're basically treating either destroying healthy tissue with radiation and at the same time not treating the parts that you, uh, you were expected to treat using the uh, pre-treatment uh, plan. So to, the success of this procedure then relies on the ability of the operator to put the needles in specific locations in the tissue. Here's another uh, example. We are talking about the bronchoscopy here. We have a small tube that is passed through the nose, down the throat, into the lungs, 
to examine a specific portion of the lung. So there is a small camera at the tip of this uh, instrument and you want to steer this instrument through a specific portions uh, path in the lung. So how can you do that? How can you control a long flexible tube as we try to steer it inside the patient's body? Yeah. It is pretty much the same as an endoscope. Yeah, it's, it's thinner than, a, than an endoscope and flexible. It would, yeah. All right, and then once the uh, the instrument is inside the lung, then you can visualize uh, specific areas of interest. Here is another application. Once a patient is suspected of having a lesion in any tissue, from determined from medical imaging, we'll use a needle to sample that lesion, and then I uh, send that sample to biopsy to histological analysis to see if it is cancerous or not. So here we have the example of a kidney um, lesion. We have an operator taking images within an ultrasound machine and then input, putting a needle inside the kidney through the back of the patient. And the idea is they're going to reach the target, take a sample, and then send that sample to a further analysis. So how can we do that under ultrasound image guidance? Given that these needles are flexible and the uh, images we get from ultrasound are not very clear. So it is not as simple, as simple as it sounds. So we're going to focus on needle tissue interaction for all these procedures. So some of those, those are simple examples of their applications. And we're going to see um, how we can make sure that the needle reaches the intended target. So most of these needles that are being used, they have a bevel. If you look at their tip, the tip is, has an angle. It's cut on an angle. And the reason for that is very simple. We want to make sure that it cuts through the tissue as inserted. Now we, we want to have an instrument that is very sharp, and as we insert it, it will uh, uh, easily cut through the tissue. But there is a problem with that, because if the needle has a bevel like that, I'll pass this one around, you can, you can take a look at the tip, be careful because it's very sharp. Um, these two needles have different bevel angles. So they'll make cutting through the tissue easy, easier, but at the same time that creates a problem. Because as we insert this bevel through the tissue, which we have over here, we are cutting through the tissue, the tissue on both sides of the needle will move away and we will apply a force back to the needle tip. Because the needle tip is not symmetric anymore, then there's going to be a, a net force pointing in the direction of the bevel and that will simply make the needle bend away from a straight line. So as you insert it, it will, if the bevel is pointing downwards, the needle will bend downwards. If the bevel points upwards, then the needle will go upwards. So this is a, 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 both a problem and a solution. Because if you didn't have the bevel, then you wouldn't have any way to correct for deviations that would occur. But because you have the bevel, and if you see that the needle is going downwards, how we correct that? Well, simply rotate it 180 degrees and make it go the other way. Right? And try to control the needle. Uh, that way. So I'll pass these ones around, take a look, but be careful, they are very sharp. These are the exact needles used in the brachytherapy procedure that I mentioned earlier. So here's a problem then from a more technical standpoint. We have, in the case of brachytherapy, we have a guiding template. That's something that uh, the needle is inserted through, is just to guide them in the tissue. It's like a rigid structure with holes. We are inserting the needle, and as we insert the needle in the tissue, the needle will go on a path. So if you do no steering whatsoever, the needle, in this case, will just bend downwards. But now we have a control action, and the control action is we can rotate the base of the needle and then change the direction of that net force at the tip, making it go the other way. So we could potentially steer the needle by midway just doing 180 degree rotation. So it's going down first, we rotate it, it goes back up, and then it eventually reaches the target. So this is a simple application because the target is in line with the insertion path, but what if the target was somewhere else? How do we reach that target? So that's the problem we want to solve. We have two control actions, the insertion and the rotation, and you're using, let's say, ultrasound images. When you use ultrasound images, you have very poor visibility of both the target and the needle, um, which are these two points here. The needle now is a continuous robot. It has an infinite number of degrees of freedom. It's not a rigid body like the robots we have in the lab. 
we have many, many degrees of freedom connected through soft springs, for example. So you can imagine it's a much more complicated problem than making a sixth off robot move to a certain position. The needle is an under-actuated system because it moves in 3D, in 6D, but you only have through con two control actions. In the case of the robot, we have 6D motion, but we have also have six joints to control. Now well, here we only have two actions, is the insertion and the rotation of the base to achieve six degrees of freedom. So that's what uh, characterizes the under-actuated system. And the needle model has no equilibrium point. If so long as there is a insertion or a rotation, the needle is going to be traveling away from the path. It never goes straight. So how do you fix this or how do you use the information to improve targeting accuracy? All the solution is modeling, estimation, predict prediction, and feedback control. So we're going to treat this problem as a control problem. And this control problem will have these many different elements. So let's start with the physical problem we want to control here, the plant, the needle, and the tissue. This is a couple system. The needle cuts the tissue, the tissue bends the needle, and back and forth. We have now a robot that we're going to add here to hold the needle and steer the needle, a controller that controls the robot, a sensor to measure where the needle is. We use that information to predict the trajectory of the needle, and then a trajectory planner that will give us a desired trajectory that we want to follow. So this is what we want to follow. This is where are we going given the current state. And then the controller will analyze that to make further actions to reach the desired target. So I have to now uh, address each of these problems. Let's just start with the number one. First, if you want to develop a control system for this plant, we need a model for that plant. We need to understand what are the dynamics of needle tissue interaction, how does or the flexion occur, and what are the consequences of that? So that's the step one, is to model and understand the interaction between the needle and the tissue. So here we have a coupled system, because as the needle cuts through the tissue, the tissue deforms, and the deformation of the tissue applies forces back to the needle, and you make the needle deform again. So the needle deforms the tissue, the tissue deforms the needle. It's a coupled, physical coupled system. So we need a model for that, and through that model, then you can develop a controller once you understand what is going on. So here are the different phases that, is, uh, that occur uh, as the needle is, go is cutting through the tissue. So the first portion here, uh, I would not recommend experimenting with that, but if you have a tissue and you put a needle through it, the first step is to puncture through that tissue. The tissue will slightly move away from the surface until the tip goes in. And once the tip goes in, then the tissue relaxes and comes back. Does that make sense? What I'm talking about? Yeah. So the first portion is the puncturing. So we are compressing the tissue. Once the needle goes in, the tissue relaxes and comes back. And once the tip now is fully inside, we reach the second phase of the interaction. That is, it, uh, it, that is the cutting phase. Now the needle is cutting through the tissue. Is breaking the tissue fibers, and as a result of that bevel, the tissue is being displaced on top at the bottom. So you're basically compressing the tissue under the needle and compressing the tissue above the needle as um, the needle travels through it. Which side of the needle will have more compression, the bottom or the top? <clears throat> In that specific way. In that specific way, the the top will have more tissue because the surface in contact is greater. And the top will have a greater tissue displacement than the bottom. If that occurs, then look what happens in the imbalance of forces part there. Now we have a f the tissue is compressed on the top of the needle. That means that there is a force normal to the bevel pointing down. Because that a force uh, is normal to the bevel, we have both a, uh, a component against the insertion and downwards. So that component, Q, the, the vertical component of that force developed at the tip is what makes the needle now bend. So as it will go in, there's a net force pointing down. The vertical component makes it bend downwards. If you rotate the needle 180 degrees, then the force reverses and it goes up. 
As we continue the insertion, now there is another factor here to take into account is that the tissue applies a force along the shaft, that's just friction. So you have a force at the tip and you have friction along the shaft. The further the needle is inside the tissue, the more friction there is along the shaft because the surface area is greater. You can certainly do constant rotation, but you're basically drilling through the tissue. Right? It's like drilling. So probably not best solution, right? <laughs> but you can give it a try. You yeah, just attach it to a drill and goes through, goes straight. Yeah, but we'll use the, that later. And then the last phase here is the tissue deformation. So if the needle is going downwards, what is happening is uh, as it goes down, it compresses all the tissue below it as it is moving downward. So imagine this way. You put the needle in, the tip is cutting a tunnel through it. Right? It's cutting that tunnel, and then the needle is bending downwards. So any difference from the position of the tool shaft from that tunnel means that the tissue is being compressed. And that tissue compression applies forces back to the needle shaft that it here are uh, modeled as a distributed load. You remember this from uh, beam theory or um, some mechani mechanics class? First year. First year, yeah. So that's a distributed load. So I have two effects now, a force at the tip and a distributed load along the shaft that counteracts the force at the tip. Does that make sense? So these are all the phases involved in this process. So now let's try to create a model for this interaction. Yeah. Uh, sorry, if there is like a tissue deformation, there's a force outside. So it will be pushed the needle if you keep inserting it, it will push the needle back and uh, make more distortion on the needle and flex it. Yeah, so the bottom applies a force up but there's always a force at the tip holding it down. Are you making that stay in equilibrium? So our first attempt to do, uh, to create a model to capture that, uh, that effect is to assume that the tissue, the tissue is rigid. So we're gonna make two assumptions here. The needle is a non-holonomic system. What's a non-holonomic system? What's a holonomic system? Our holonomic system can move in any direction at any point in space. A non-holonomic system can't. What is a, uh, what's an example of a non-holonomic system? A system that can direction. Yeah. A car. If you want to park a car, they, if you're here, you want to go there, you can some, simply slide. You have to go like that, right? So the car can move in all directions. It's the same story here. The needle is a non-holonomic system, and uh, the assumption is that it always follows a constant path uh, with a constant curvature. And then the second uh, assumption you're going to make is the tissue is not rigid, it is, is not uh, deformable, it's rigid. So you're gonna model this exactly as a car, or a bicycle in this particular case. Here we have what I'm gonna call a bicycle model for the needle. Very simple idea, we have two wheels, a front wheel and back wheel. They are connected by a distance A and B, so A is the distance from the for first wheel to uh, the tip of the needle. And then B, we'll put a, another needle B um, uh, units ahead of the tool tip. We are gonna give it a steering angle here. So the greater that is steering angle, the greater the curvature of the flexion. And here we have our control actions. The first one is the insertion speed. And the sec second one is the rotation of the needle. So the needle here can move in 3D. If you simply rotate it like that, we can now make the tool tip go in any direction. All right. So this works like, uh, it, it's called a bicycle, non-holonomic bicycle model, because you now you can make the needle move in a certain curvature by fixing this. Now this we cannot change during control. This is a, this depends on the bevel of the needle, but it will always move at this curvature. If you want to now control the curvature, just control the speed of rotation of the base. Does that make sense, that model, so far? Yeah? So we have two inputs, the insertion speed and the angular velocity of the tool shaft. 
And by by change, if, we, if we change 180 degrees, for example, it goes up. But uh, what we are controlling here is the speed at which we make those rotations. And given the parameters that we have here, now I'm going to go through the derivation. I just ask you to accept equation one. The curvature of the flexion is the tangent of the steering angle divided by a plus b. Makes sense, right? The farther they are from one another, or the smaller the radius of cur curvature. The greater phi, the greater the radius of curvature. Right? This is the input, and that's now the output. One of the, is the radius of curvature, and the output is then the position or and orientation of the tool tip. So, how are we going to model this? If you think about, uh, we want to know where the tool tip is with respect to a certain coordinate system. If you think about uh, lectures two and three around there, we, we had a way to model the distance between, or the, the, the uh, position of frame with respect to another using homogeneous transformations. Uh, we can use the same here. We can put a frame at the tool tip and another frame somewhere, which is our frame of reference, and then try to um, connect their position based on the speed of the rotation angle and, uh, and the insertion of the tool. So that's what we're going to do there. I have two frames. Frame A is attached to the tool's base. And frame B is at the tool's tip. One's at the base, one is at the tip. So if we have a frame B, it's fully described with respect to A by specifying the 3D, three-dimensional Cartesian offset of frame B with respect to frame A, and the Euler angles of frame B with respect to frame A, fixed Euler angles. Exactly the same that we had before. So here we have frame A, and I'm attaching frame B to the tip, and this is the path followed by frame B, or the path followed by the tooltip. Right? And then the orientation of the tooltip will depend on the, basically the orientation of frame B. So A, B, and alpha are, uh, excuse me, alpha, gamma, and beta here are, um, alpha, beta, and gamma are the uh, Euler angles of that. Right? So this is very good, but how do we relate them? I'm going to skip the derivations here because that will, will probably take a lecture in itself. So somebody has done this for us, and uh, it turns out that you can relate the speed of in x, y, and z of the tooltip and the speed, the, ch the rate of change of the Euler angles with the insertion velocity and the rotational velocity through this matrix. It's very simple calculation. It's basically decomposing the velocity of uh, V at the base and then the, the, the rotation is, is changing the way it is, uh, it is um, moving. So it's simply a projection of the, the speed of the, the, the of vector of frame B at, on frame A. So we get now the input here. This is a constant matrix and these are this is the output. Now notice that uh, here we have alpha, beta, and everything, and here we have their derivatives. Same as, the, remember the Jacobian story? Uh, it's very similar, very similar to that. So these parameters are changing constantly. It's actually not constant. What I meant is the derivation is constant, but the values here are changing constantly. So we have now two inputs. Here we have the insertion depth over time, and here we have the speed or the position angle of the, the, the base, we take the derivative of that, multiply by A, we get P dot integrate, get P, and P changes A. Right, it's a constant update, exactly like the Jacobian idea in robotics. So here's um, um, the implementation of that in MATLAB if you want to, to use it, but here are the results. Let's look at the same, the first one. First one is for a speed equals to zero, so you're not rotating, you're just inserting the needle. And you have a curvature that goes between 0 0.1 and 1 meters. So you can see that as you insert the needle, it bends downwards. No surprise there. You see that the greater the radius of curvature, 
that it depends on the bevel, the greater the deflection downwards. In the second one here, I'm now rotating the needle. So the speed is no longer zero. The speed goes from zero to 0 0.1 to 0 0.5. Now look what happens. When you have now a speed of 0 0.1 radians per second, <clears throat> midway through, we are slowly rotating the needle. So I'm sh showing here a two-dimensional view, but in fact, the needle is going on a spiral. Right? And you can see here that midway through, it goes back up. And then the last example is at higher speeds. Now you're literally drilling through the tissue. It works. Right? And you can see the small deviations going through. Right? Um, <coughs> so it works in theory. Right? So problem solved. So here is an example of what I mean by that. So here is the bevel. The bevel is going at first up. It's at 90 degrees, so the needle moves upwards. When I move the bevel downwards, I'm rotating at 180 degrees the other way. Now the needle moves downwards and back. All right, so if I take the speed, uh, which is the input here, the speed is zero if the bevel is constant, then it changes, then it changes again and again. All right? If I have a, a constant speed, like in one of those, that's the variation of the speed. It's basically bevel up, bevel down, bevel up, bevel down. And then you can achieve these different curvatures through, through that. Yeah? It, yeah, the, uh, in this graph here, it is just going back and forth. Uh, in the other one, the, the red curve is a continuous rotation. Yeah. But this one here is just up and down. We can do it either way. All right, so in this example, we have either 0 or pi over 2. Uh, oh, sorry, should it be pi, not pi over 2. Right? So it should be 180 degrees. But we could also do continuous rotation and stop midway and find a proper combination of insertion and rotation so that any point in 3D can be reached. See, here is an example. It's a 3D representation of it. We have rotations that are going, um, it's not simply 0 and 180. It's going out of that range. And then you can see that you can achieve three-dimensional motion through that. Okay, so it sounds like that depending on how much we rotate this thing, um, we can now control the curvature depending on how much rotation we give to it. So we're going to introduce something here called the duty cycle. You guys know what a duty cycle is? Yeah? Well, the duty cycle is uh, on a signal like that is a periodic signal. This one has two values, either 0 or pi. Not pi over 2, should be pi. We are either keeping it at 0 or at pi. So the duty cycle is the percentage of time we will keep the value either at 0 or pi. So we are giving this, let's say we are allowing ourselves to switch the direction every t seconds. So this is the period of the signal. Every t seconds we can make the decision of changing it or not. Within one period, we are keeping the needle up, bevel up by t, at t1 seconds, and then t minus t1, we reverse it down, and we repeat. So there is now a percentage of time where it goes one way, a percentage of the time where it goes the other way. That percentage of time is simply the ratio t1 over t. So the ratio, or the amount of time we keep it at pi, right, instead of pi over 2, and that's what I call the duty cycle. So the duty cycle can go from 0, if t1 is 0, which means that the needle is kept at the top value, or 1 when t1 is t one's is the same as t, right? which means that the needle is then just kept at 0 value. So we cannot make some observations here. So if we do t1 equals to 0, then the duty cycle is 0. 
And what's the curvature? Well, the curvature the needle travels is the natural curvature. Right? It's just K, kappa, because we are not changing its direction. The bevel is always in the same position. So let's assume it's moving downwards. So if the duty cycle is zero, the needle moves downwards and has a curvature kappa. What happens if T equals to T1 equals to T? Now we are keeping the needle at zero degrees all the time. Where should the needle go? Which curvature? It should just reverse. It will go up. The duty cycle is now one. The needle goes up and it goes up by with a curvature kappa. Right? So this is then minus so kappa. We, so we define curving up as minus and curving down as well as that. Yeah, that's uh, just a, 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 a is that convention. Canonical or is that arbitrary? No, it's arbitrary. It's just the convention. Now let's assume that a T1 is half of T. So in, for half of the time we keep it up, uh, half of the time we move it down. Up, down, up, down. What's the curvature? Should be half. Right, should be half. Stop. Or should it be zero? It should, it should be zero, right? Some of the time you're positive, okay, some of the time it's negative. It should be right up to zero. So the, 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 the net translation should be, the net deflection should be zero. Right, so if we keep it half of the time up, half of the time down, we are basically compensating for everything. So this should go to zero. Which means we can now come up with an expression that it gives the actual curvature based on the duty cycle. This is the duty cycle, T over T1. Uh, and that expression will now tell us uh, what is the exact curvature we can achieve by now changing the duty cycle, by changing the amount of time it, keeps, uh, it goes up or down. Now, how many times we change it up and down is independent of the duty cycle. That is the frequency. That depends on 1 over capital T. All right, so if 1 over capital T is, let's say, is 1, so 1 hertz, so you are doing this, making this decision every 1 second, and you have a duty cycle of, let's say, 60% or 0.6, then for 0 0.6 seconds, the needle points up. 0 0.4 seconds, it points down, up and down. And you're doing that adjustment every one second. Or you can go higher in, in, uh, in time, a lower frequency, and make that slower. But you see that it does not affect the definition of the duty cycle. Right? It's just how many times we are doing per second. Did you have a question? Oh, is that pi by two supposed to be pi? It's supposed to be pi, yeah. Okay, so that's the a simple, very simple idea. So what problems can you see with this approach? The tissue, the tissue is rigid, but in reality, the tissue is not. The tissue is soft, is, can deform, is deformable. What else? The curvature, if that is the case, is not constant, depending on the composition of the tissue and how much energy the needle is, is, is storing as it bends. The curvature may change. What else? The tissue may be uh, it may not be homogeneous, which means that for different portions of the tissue, we have uh, different forces acting on the needle. Right? And um, we also don't know where the shaft of the, of the needle is. All these plots that we have here are simply the position of the tool tip. What if we want to reach a target? over here, but we have an obstacle there. We not only need to know all the path taken by the tip, but we also need to know once the tip is there, what's the shaft? Is the shaft going to touch the obstacle or not? Because all these graphs, this is basically a collection of the tool tip for each point in space that we have there while we have the shaft of the tool like that, that we don't see in the simulations because we assume we don't know what it is because we don't have a model for it. All right, so well, 
we can make that assumption that it's all the, the history of the tooltip is the path. And in this case, it has to be, because otherwise there will be some tissue deformation and some forces applied to it. But it's not um, necessarily a, um, a, a, an assumption that it, it, we can justify uh, in some cases. So another option is to use a mechanics-based model and then bring in um, the dynamics of the needle. So that's another option. So this is going to see in this, uh, so this is going to get a bit complicated, but I don't expect it to fully follow the math. We're now going to model the tissue. And we're going to model the tissue as a viscoelastic medium. That means that it has, is composed of small elements connected together here, a lumped model of a spring and damper. The spring models the elasticity of the tissue, the damper models the viscosity of that tissue. We are going to go back to that example from the beginning where we have the needle traveling through the tissue. There is a force developed at the tip, and then the force will make the tissue deform under the shaft. The, the force under the shaft applies, uh, the deformation under the shaft applies a, a load back to the tip. Okay, so that's a coupled physical model. So what are these forces? then that are being applied back to the needle. Well, if that's how we are modeling the tissue, then under the tool shaft here, we have basically a collection of springs and dampers that are applying a force back to the needle um, up. Okay, so here we have a compressed load, a, excuse me, a distributed load, I'm gonna call that Q, and the deflection of the needle at any point in time and any point along its shaft, they're gonna call that a VZT. Z for the position along the shaft, and T for the time. So here is the main assumption you're going to make. If V is the position of the tool shaft and VT is the historical position of the tool tip, we can calculate the amount of tissue displacement through them. So the idea is that as we insert the needle, it cuts a tunnel, the tissue then compresses, uh, applies a force to the needle, the needle moves down, and as it moves down, it's moving away from that tunnel. So to move away from that tunnel, it has to compress the tissue under or above it. What's the amount of tissue compression? Well, the amount of tissue compression is whatever uh, portions of the shaft that are no longer on the tunnel that was cut by the needle, that was bored by the needle tip. So if we know where the shaft is and we call the shaft V and the position, of um, the tool shaft uh, VT, the difference between them is how much the needle deviated from the tunnel, meaning that if it's, it got away from the tunnel, then it's compressing the tissue below it. So that a difference here times the stiffness of the tissue is the distributed load that the tissue applies back to the needle. Does that make sense? Now notice here that uh, these are functions of time and also functions of the position along the shaft. Right? And that a difference multiplied by the stiffness constant of the tissue then gives the distributed load applied to it. So that tips yeah. Now otherwise, you're not forcing the tissue, you're just cutting through. Okay. So we can um, uh, mathematically express this a little differently. This is a snapshot of the tool shaft at a given point along its shaft. It has a deflection at a given point in time. What is the tool tip tunnel? Isn't that the historical position of the tool tip? The tunnel is the historical position of the tool tip. Where is the tool tip? The tool tip is when Z is the length of the needle. So if you call that L, the length of the needle is L, the deflection of the needle at L is the deflection of the tip. But at the deflection of the tip, let's say I'm uh, fully inserted the needle in the tissue. I can look at a current snapshot of the tool tip or the tool shaft. But if I look past, in the past where V of L was 
tau uh, seconds behind in time, that's where the tooltip was. So this is basically that delayed in time measure at the tooltip. Yeah. Okay, so now we have an expression for the um, for the distributed 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 load along the shaft. How do we go from the distributed load to the deflection of a beam? If you consider the needle to be a cantilever beam, so it's been holding in one point, only I can relate the deflection of that beam to the distributed load by simply taking the uh, if the moment of inertia and the Young's modulus are constant, is simply by integrating the distributed load four times. You remember that from physics? So integrate distributed load, the distributed load four times, and you go from the distributed load all the way to the deflection of the tool. So the first integral of the distributed load is the force applied to the shaft. So here is where we add Q. We take the integral of this distributed load we add the force at the tooltip, the force that is created by cutting. If you integrate the result one more time, then you have the shear moment at any point along the tool shaft. If we integrate that one more time, we get the deflection slope. And if you integrate the slope, we get the deflection. So very simple, ish. Just take the fourth integral of the load, add the force at the tip at some point, and the problem is solved. We have now the deflection of the load. The problem here is that we don't know the load until we know the deflection. We don't know the deflection until we know the load. So we have to somehow um, solve that duality there. Is this part clear? Does that make sense, sort of? No, that, that's from, um, from mechanics. So here is where it starts to get complicated. If you want to model the needle as a beam, we are going to make an assumption that the needle is a cantilever beam and it has modes of vibration. These modes of vibration are the shapes the needle can take over time at different points uh, when it's vibrating. So if it has one mode of vibration, or let's put it one mode of vibration, there is one point along the shaft, then when the needle, the, the, the beam vibrates, that point doesn't change. Everything else changes, but at that point, it doesn't. The second mode of vibration, guess what, has two fixed points. As the beam vibrates, everything on the beam moves, but those two points don't move. Third mode, three, three points. Fourth mode, four points, and so on. So we can describe the, the shape, the po the pos all possible shapes that the needle can take up to an infinite number of vibration modes using this equation here. So this equation is just giving you those shapes for different vibration modes. When uh, ki is one is one mode, ki is two is second mode, third mode, and so on. B, uh, beta is the same. Right? So these are constants for a clamped free cantilever beam that are, have been calculated for like beam theory. There's a whole book about it. I don't know how they calculate it, and I don't care. But here they are. I know that if I plug these in, I can get the first, an equation that it gives the first mode, an equation that it gives the second and third, and so on. Well, the problem is when the needle deflects in the tissue, it's not going to take any of these modes. But it might take a combination of them, or a weighted combination of them. So what we're going to assume is that the needle can take a sum of a vibration mode times a weight. What's that weight? That's what you have to find. So the, the um, advantage here is that we are assuming known forms for the needle shaft. We are adding these known forms together. And when we add them, we multiply each of them by a weight. That weight is what we have to find, and we don't know that. So that's now the problem. Instead of finding the entire deflection, is just about finding these weights that are called here 
G i. Uh, if you are assuming 10 vibration modes, there will be 10 weights and so on. So the way we are going to find that is to minimize the energy in the system. How do you minimize the energy in the system? We have to now calculate the total energy, take the derivative of the energy, set that to zero, and the only variable left is the weight. So to get there, now we need to define everything that I can create and store energy in the system. Now thinking about a needle deflected in the tissue, what can store energy there? The, uh -huh, the bending of the needle, so the stored energy, the strain energy in the needle. What else? The compression of the tissue, the potential energy. in the tissue, which is simply the potential energy of the springs. Right? So these are the result of applying a work that I created that deflection. What is that work? What's creating that work? Is the force created by tissue cutting, force at the tip. Right, so if you multiply the force at the tip, that we call that Q, by the displacement of the needle at the tip, then that gives the amount of work we are injecting into the system that it creates this stored energy. So what can you do now is add everything up and to find the balance, the balance will occur when the potential reaches its minimum. And when, to find the minimum, we just add everything up, take the derivative with respect to the only variable in the system, which is the weights of the vibration modes, set that to zero, get the vibration modes. Very simple. The Q, this is this, yeah, this is the force, and this is the deflection V. Yeah. Okay, so here is the calculation for all that. So the work done is force times displacement, and that's at the tooltip. We're putting a negative sign because it's going downwards, it's going against the, the rest. The bending strain energy stored in the tool is given by this. This is from mechanics, just the integral of the uh, second derivative of uh, displacement. And the potential energy stored in the tissue, this, what is this? The potential energy in the spring, isn't it? is a potential energy in a spring, one half of k times the displacement is squared. But I have to integrate it along the portion of the needle that is inside the tissue. That's what the integral is doing. It's the strain energy for a small load elements integrated over the entire shaft. That's what the integral does. Now that we have these three elements, we can calculate the potential just adding everything up. That's that a beautiful equation on top. The only variable we have in here is the variable that defines V as a function of a sum of vibration modes that are known times the weight of each vibration mode. So we only have the weight of vibration modes. So we can take the derivative of this with respect to the vibration. Uh, sorry, there's a mistake here. This should be G, not M. This is G, the weight. of the vibration, let me just check how I call it. Yeah, that's right, so M is the mode and G is the weight of each mode. Take the derivative of that, set it to zero and then solve for, for it. So here is the derivative of that big equation. Uh, sorry, that's the equation itself. Now we take the derivative of it we expand the terms, I'm going to skip that because there's no, no, no point in, um, in going too far with it. And then um, I see the derivatives appearing here. The result of that is um, this, expan this expansion in 20 is a sum of a mode times all these are constants that we know from the tissue, needle tissue parameter. The only thing that we don't know is this. 
Now notice that this is a sum in J. So for N vibration modes, we have N equations. So how do we solve for it now? Well, it's simply a system of equations. We have on this side here N equations equals to K, just to invert this side, and then we get G, um, the vibration modes. Okay, so in the other problem there, we had uh, the ability to change the direction of deflection by changing the orientation. How do we do it here? What is causing the deflection in the first place? Is the force Q. So if Q is positive, it goes one way. If Q is negative, it goes the other way. So you can, this is a two-dimensional model. We cannot account for 3D motion. So if you want to change the direction, just change the sign of Q. That's an approximation. Oh. Yeah, we have to do that way. Yeah. M is the vibration mode. This is the equation that it gives this, these forms uh, of the tool shaft. Okay, so we can expand this equation because we have n vibration modes. So you basically have all the vibration modes times a constant uh, matrix here, square matrix, equals to a constant, equals to the force at the tip. That shouldn't be F, it's Q. So it's easy now to invert this and find G, and once you find G, then we know the true deflection of the needle by just going back to this equation over here. These are known, and these are now calculated, so you can find the true deflection. Okay, so here are some simulation results. So now, now what you see here is the evol evolution of the tool shaft. Before we had the evolution of the tool tip, here is the entire shaft. I'm inserting it into the tissue and taking, make, doing some rotations at um, certain points in, in time. Not rotating at all, rotating halfway through and rotating a bit later. So each of these curves is the, sh the, put the shape the shaft would assume once it reaches the destination. So you can see the destination, the tool tip over here, and, but once the tooltip is there, we know that this is the shaft. Right? So that's the advantage compared to the other method, is that now we have both. We have the position of the tool tip, but also the entire shaft when the, the tip reaches that destination through the, um, these maneuvers that we applied. So here is a link to a paper that explains this in, uh, in details if you want to uh, look at that in more detail. So the next element here is, that now it gets a bit easier, is the sensor to measure where we are and then predict where we are going. So typically we use ultrasound images. So two types of ultrasound images. So here we have the needle being inserted into this tube. The first one is the longitudinal image. So the needle is, where are the needles? Could you grab them for me? So if the needles are inserted like this. This is the ultrasound imaging plane. It is in line, it's parallel to the needle shaft. So when you look at the needle in the images, it will appear at a line like that. Right, so you see here the cross section of the two. Right, and you see the shaft of the needle. The other option is sagittal images. So the needle is like that, but now the ultrasound is at a 90 degree angle. So what you see is just a cross section of the needle shaft. So you only see a, a little dot that is not even showing here over there, a little white dot on the images. And that's all the information you have to control the position of the tool. So here is a more detailed version. We have the transducer imaging the shaft of the needle. We have the transducer imaging a cross section of the needle, just switch the transducer direction. Some of this transducer will have a mechanical way to move inside with a mechanical uh, system, make the imaging plane move like that at a very low rate, like probably four or five hertz. And then you can get a three-dimensional image from a two-dimensional 
um, transducer, or we can simply translate the transducer and then uh, stack these images together to find the 3D image, which is um, currently a, um, a project going on in the lab. Another option is to insert a sensor inside the needle shaft. It's a very small electromagnetic sensor that goes inside the shaft. And uh, there is a field, a magnetic field generator on the side. It creates a magnetic field. This small sensor is like a small coil that it will receive the electromagnetic field, will be uh, magnetized, and then based on the response it gets, we can infer where it is. So this is you, we have one of those in the lab. This is actually used in some surgeries to detect the three-dimensional position of the, sh the tool shaft. There, you recognize that a little robot there. Right? That's the mecha doing its job is steering that a big tool through a thick layer of like pork meat. And you can see how it is bending. Right? So we, we want to validate that model using, using that. The next part is the controller. Now that we know where the needle is, we know what happens if you take a certain action. We can develop a controller to bring the needle to where we want. So three types of controller. The first one is what I'm going to call weak regulation. You're just concerned with the destination of the tooltip. You want it to go to a point, to reach that point, period. The second one is regulation. We want to minimize deflection at all times. We want it to make it go on a straight path. And then the last one is tracking. We have here two obstacles and we want to reach this point. So we first predefine a path that we want to follow and then the controller will let, make the needle follow that predefined path. So what it could do is to now use the models we developed before and evaluate where we are going to go, or where, where the needle is going to end up for a certain set of control actions. For example, we could allow X rotations to happen during the steering process. And now try to evaluate all possible outputs, all possible combinations of these rotations at different depths in time and see where the needle goes. So here is the depth, uh, 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 an optimization that shows the depth of the first rotation the depth at which the second rotation occurs, and the third rotation. And then we get evaluate a cost function, basically telling us how far we are from the goal. It's just an optimization problem that uses the model we developed previously. And this is the result of that. For any point that you pick here, you're specifying the depth of the first rotation, second, and third. We run that through the model, and we see where we are. Right, so we can do this in real time to make the robot uh, steer the needle properly and uh, reach a certain point in space. Finally, we have the robot itself. So here is a few levels of autonomy that we could grant to a robot. The first one level is fully manual, so there is no assistance at all. Second one is assisted manual. We have some sort of visual aid that uses any of these methods we, we talked about to help the, the, the user guide the needle. Second one, semi-automated. We give some autonomy to the system. The, use, the user does one portion of the job, the system does another portion of the job, and then fully automated the third level. So here is level one. We have this guy using virtual reality that is tracking the position of the needle base. And you can see here where the needle is going, this uh, uh, overlaid images in green use uh, are basically calculated from the models we developed, we talked about before. Now we know where the tool position is and then we can see where we are going. If you take no action, uh, that's where it's going to end up. So that's level one, augmented reality. Here's level two. Now we want to give some autonomy to the robot and here is a steering device that was developed for this purpose. So you attach the needle to this device here. This device can rotate the needle base, but the insertion is, is still in, um, done by the operator. Now the robot doesn't insert the needle, it just rotates it. It will calculate the depth, and then based on the controller, uh, based on the model, it will determine the rotations as you insert it. Right? 
So we still keep the human in control of the operation. So I have this small unit here that rotates it. And there's another uh, interesting addition to this is that the, this top part here that holds the needle has a piezoelectric actuator on the top and you make the needle vibrate at a very high frequency. And guess what that does? What's that for? Easy cutting the tissue and making uh, friction go down. Because the needle is a, uh, when you put the needle in a tissue, the tissue acts like a low pass filter. If you move it slowly, the tissue moves along with it. If you now move the needle too fast, the tissue doesn't have enough time to react to that. It will basically remain static. So friction goes down. So these added vibrations will make cutting indeed easier, but it will also reduce the friction along the shaft of the needle. Yeah. If, uh, no, that's cutting, uh, just tissue cutting. Uh, so that's the addition of that piezoelectric actuator on the top there. Here's the paper that uh, describes the whole thing. Here's another example. This is a uh, fully automated, and this is a MRI-compatible robot, meaning that it can have no ferromagnetic parts. I have to, that's why you see all, all, all these 3D printed or uh, acrylic parts there, because you want to put this in a MRI machine. And it does the same same thing. So you have a positional system to position the, to the, to the, the, the robot and you see a belt here with a pulley that rotates the needle and then you see that this can slide back and forth with the insertion uh, uh, actuator that inserts and then you have the other one rotating. That's fully autonomous. The reason we want to put this in MRI is that lesions are typically more visible in MRI than they are in ultrasound. But then the constraint is we can simply put a DC motor in here. DC motor would interact with the, the magnetic field. It would, it would be a disaster. Instead, we have to use other types of actuators, for example, pneumatic actuators that just take compressed air to, to rotate. Yeah. And MRI machines, is it possible to use non-magnetic like, metals, like aluminum or? They have to have a very, very low permeability. So we see, we see some small parts of metal in there, but you cannot have anything ferromagnetic. Here's another one. This is a bit more sophisticated one, but this one is for prostate biopsy and it uses ultrasound. So we see the ultrasound probe over here coming out of it. I'll let you uh, figure out what that goes. And uh, on Top here we have the needle being inserted and uh, steered by um, inserted manually, but we see that the robot is now controlling its deflection by moving the shaft up and down. 